Hello and welcome to Leading Minds, expert voices from the College of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences here at NUI Galway. My name is Jonathan McRae. Research at the college aims to improve healthcare regionally, nationally and globally. And today we're looking at research into language and more specifically bilingualism and multilingualism. We're joined by Dr. Stanislav or Stasha and Tony Jurich, uh, Elliot and Dr. Mary Pat O'Malley. Uh, you're both very welcome. Uh, Stasha, perhaps we might start uh, with you because uh, you have followed um, uh, around the world with your research. Uh, why did you become interested in language and the study of languages? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, I come from, from Northern Serbia, so from the region that um, is naturally multilingual. It's kind of like part of Europe where different nations mingled. And so in that region at one point in time, uh, there were three official languages, Serbian, uh, Hungarian and German. Uh, there are multiple uh, minorities and multiple languages spoken. They have their schools and so on. So the whole area is multicultural and multilingual. And then very early on, I started learning other languages and I really enjoyed that. And I still enjoy languages. So, you know, that kind of was natural to then uh, in the university kind of become, I studied psychology as, as my main uh, subject, but very early on, like in, in this, the second year, I started um, kind of leaning towards research on languages. And uh, actually before deciding to study psychology, I was seriously considering studying English and German, but then I thought, okay, maybe it's a good idea to study actually something else and then just use languages to communicate. So that, that's how I ended up. Uh, being interested in languages and then I lived in different uh, different countries I lived in Germany and then in Ireland so you know personally kind of um, speaking multiple languages I kind of naturally leaned towards uh, doing research in multilingualism. Um, what is the definition of bilingualism or multilingualism? Because obviously in Ireland here we study um, Irish, but I would not say that I am a fluent Irish speaker. Is there a level at which someone tips over into being bilingual or, or multilingual? It's very interesting what you just said, because you ticked a few kind of prejudices related to language, but also something very true is that uh, in order to be, now we use more term kind of multilingual than bilingual because multilingual kind of includes bilingualism as well. Yeah. But you, you, you really rightly pointed uh, out that, uh, so you don't feel that you use Irish and that you, you and that is exactly the point that we, uh, use to define multilingualism kind of uh, in functional terms. Uh, you don't have to be very proficient, but you need to use the language in your everyday life. Right. Okay. okay. So studying Irish as additional subject at school and never being interested in it and using it is not multilingualism. But let's say uh, moving into Connemara, taking your child to... Um, Irish medium school and talking to your neighbours even a little bit can count towards multilingualism. Why is it important to study something like this, uh, do you think, Mary Pat? Um, why is the, the study of multilingualism and its effect on our mind and our, our culture and society, why is that important? Well, that's a very interesting um, question, Jonathan, because like Astasha said, it is the global norm that more people speak two or more languages than speak one language only. And traditionally speaking, a lot of the research on language development in children has focused on monolingual English speaking children. Um, so my background is in speech and language therapy and we have children, you know, coming to the clinic who speak a range of languages and in order to be able to diagnose, we'll say, language difficulties, we need to understand what does language development in multilingual children look like in general when things are going along expected lines in order to be able to work out when things are not going as expected. Right. So you're talking about um, uh, children who are speaking two different languages. How do you know if one of them has a difficulty? Because it's difficult to speak two languages in the first place. 
Well, actually, that's an interesting point as well, Jonathan, because it's not more difficult to speak to if it's the global norm, but that's kind of one of the misconceptions that's out there. And if we think of language development in children in general, no matter how many languages you're acquiring, there's an awful lot goes into even arriving at the point where you're saying your first word. Um, and in terms of speech and language therapy, it's more to do with if the child, let's say, for example, has spoken Polish only at home, until they start preschool or school and then they're exposed to English. We need to know like how long have they been exposed to both of their languages? How much exposure have they had? What's the quality of it being? Their opportunities to use it, their motivation in order to work out, is this a, a genuine language problem or is it just um, a feature of speaking the two languages or more, we'll say. And, and so how often does that come up in your practice and, and how do you go about determining whether or not someone has a, a language difficulty? Um, well, I suppose Ireland is now so diverse that I imagine there can't be a clinic in the country that hasn't encountered, you know, children um, who speak two or more languages. And there are certainly challenges around assessing, you know, completely and accurately. So the challenges would be, for example, the best practice guidelines state that we are supposed to assess children in all of their languages in order to get a, pro a proper picture of what's going on, because their language skills are distributed across the languages that they're speaking. So with the last example I gave, if you've used Polish let's say primarily at home, um, maybe with your peers or siblings or extended family, you'll have vocabulary to do with all those contexts. And then you go to school and you're going to be acquiring, let's say, the vocabulary and the concepts in English. So your vocabulary is distributed across the languages. Um, so one challenge is time. It's going to take longer to assess multilingual children in the healthcare system because we need to assess all of their languages. Um, and you know, the systems are very constrained and resources are kind of overburdened. So that's a difficulty. And then another issue is that the, the profession of speech and language therapy generally is quite homogenous. So um, and most of the professionals tend to be monolingual English speakers. Yeah. And there's the issue of what are the measures that are available to us to actually use um, and there are limits there as well. We'd also need access to interpreters because obviously we won't necessarily speak all the languages of the client, but there are plenty of ways around it. And Sasha and myself are involved in a range of projects kind of ho hoping to make things better in terms of the assessment. And, and in terms of the actual treatment, uh, presumably it depends on the language or, or um, if you identify some deficiency or a learning difficulty, you you can't you can't it, it, i mean does, is it language dependent i'm not going to make any assumptions now because i seem to be learning Another, everything new again today it's a great no great question jonathan because again the best practice guidelines from the professional bodies state that we must address all languages that the child needs and not just current uses but we need to think about their future uses as well um, because I think Stasha mentioned, you know, where she came from and that's a language and culture because language isn't just for communication, it's for the transmission of cultural heritage, for identity. Um, and like there's a useful kind of analogy around if, let's say, I write with my right hand um, and unfortunately often, um, you know, parents may be advised to drop the home language in a kind of a mistaken belief that it will make things easier. But that's like if I was told to stop using my left hand you very quickly realize how much you actually need your left hand for. So we should never advise the dropping of the home language and um, because we really need in the intervention to support both. It does depend on what the nature of the problem is. So let's say, for example, a child is late to talk, which would mean, let's say, for example, they are two and they are not combining words together. Or they're using very few single words or they're not understanding what's being said to them. The intervention then would be via the parents. So you would kind of uh, coach them around the strategies that are known to help language development along. If I was doing it, I'd be doing it, let's say in English, because that's my first language. And then I would be discussing with the parents how they would do it in the home language at home. And also I'd be checking with them if my recommendations were culturally consistent with their styles of interaction. So again, a lot of the intervention techniques are based on um, kind of white, Western, middle-class styles of interacting, but we know there are lots of different cultural 
a different, uh, sorry, cultural differences around what's considered the way to interact with the child. So in some cultures, for example, they think you teach the child language. So in that case, we would frame it as, well, by playing the game where we're incorporating new vocabulary, you are teaching them the language. So we try to match the culture right. um, expectations of the families. Is it, Stasha, when you're working with um, multilingual children and multilingual parents, are, are, are you are you trying to get them to keep that home language if they've come to Ireland and now are are are, are using English and their their home language? And is, is it is that a, is there any resistance to that? Because it must be hard, uh, I suppose, for the parents if they you know to to keep that up sometimes. If there's resistance from the kids that they feel like they don't need that, which which does happen sometimes. Yeah, I mean it it it's, it is difficult. And, uh, you know, in, in one of the recent uh, talks, uh, Professor Erika Hoff said something that the title of the talk was that multilingualism po is possible, but not easy. Mm -hmm. And she referred in that to um, Spanish in the US, where, you know, at the beginning you have people speaking and children speak Spanish as they come as immigrants and then they speak Spanish. But as soon as they go to, to high school and university, that Spanish is lost. Mm. And lots of that happens, uh, happens in Ireland as well. Although I have to say that uh, Ireland uh, is good in, let's say, maybe not so good in supporting those language heritage languages, but in um, allowing them to, allowing people to, to organize and support them at home. Um, it, it is difficult because you need exposure in order to acquire any language. Mm. So parents need to build up. And I remember with my own son when I, there was a point where I completely clearly realized, okay, it's two of us who speak that language. If I don't speak all of the time, then he, he doesn't have anywhere else to hear it. Yeah. So I started just talking, everything that I was doing, I was saying, okay, now I'm doing blah, blah, and blah, blah. And then I'm doing, I don't know, I'm pouring water into, you know, into pot or something. When we played, I kind of kept talking all of the time. And that is actually good strategy for both monolingual and multilingual children. Right. Um, maybe one other, other point to make is that uh, one other uh, kind of misconception about uh, multilingualism is that it's hard to learn multiple languages and we don't um, people think of of let's say our brain or our capacity to learn languages as a vessel which you kind of fill in uh, with different languages and there is this limited capacity which you can't you know exceed and that that's actually completely not the case learning language is like learning anything else and our brains have virtually endless capacity to learn. Mm -hmm. We never encountered a person who learned everything and, you know, couldn't learn more. So the same thing is with languages. We have... I, I suppose um, uh, for, for many, the, re the, the reason they find um, language difficult is because they imagine a fluency um, that they need to achieve and they find that difficulty. And, and I speak French and I speak Spanish, I speak a little bit of Italian and a little bit of very small amount of German. But unless I'm exposed to those languages regularly, um, I start losing the verbs and I start. But, but one of the things that I'm wondering um, is how important is the personality to, um, to their ability to, to, to learn? Um, for example, someone who's very gregarious, I'm a very extrovert sort of person. I will sit in a room with a stranger and suddenly start up a conversation with them. I got that from my mom who who does this everywhere, doesn't matter who the person is or what the scenario is, my mom wants to have a chat with people. And, and as a result, I'm more likely to, to stumble through a terrible order of food and be corrected by the waiter and so on. Uh, whereas some people who, um, who may have more exposure to the language because they're, they don't have the, the confidence or maybe they're not that extrovert uh, personality, maybe they don't um, practice it because of that reason. I'm wondering, is there a relationship that, that there between per personality and, uh, and the output? That's an excellent question. And I can tell you that, uh, so my grandfather was German language teacher. 
And I loved it from the beginning, you know, from, from the early memories. He would teach us nursery rhymes and then more about cases in German and all of that kind of stuff. And my sister was very sporty and she would dash off immediately <laughs> as soon as he comes. She would kind of go do some sporty things outside. And I loved kind of sitting with him and learning German. And but now my sister works in German school. Uh, she got married and her husband works in Germany. So that's that's where they live. But she's so extrovert that she you know, it doesn't matter that that she didn't have talent for languages and didn't want to learn languages or anything like that. She's so extrovert that she had to speak. So from that, she just kind of um, really zoomed through learning German when she actually needed it to communicate. So that, that's another point of, do you need to communicate in that language? So take me through some of the research that you're working on, Mary Pat, at the, at the college and, and the sort of collaborations uh, that you're undertaking. Sure. So uh, myself and Stasha are working on a very interesting project looking at storytelling um, in Irish and English as a way to fairly assess language in multilingual children. Um, so there is um, a researcher, Natalia Gagarina, and multiple colleagues across Europe have devised this um, instrument. It's called Main Multilingual Assessment Instrument for Narratives. Um, and we have worked with other Irish speakers as well to adapt it to Irish because it's an interesting question in terms of testing in different languages. You can't translate a test from one language into another because the languages have different rules, different grammars, so things operate differently. Mm. Um, so with the main, the way it works with, say, in other countries would be you administer it in, I would say, um, English and German, we say, for instance. Um, and then there is, um, so there is a series of pictures and the child, there are different ways of eliciting the story, depending what you're looking for. Um, so you show the child the pictures, let's say, for instance, um, and you get them to tell you a story. That's one way of doing it. Um, you, another way is where you've pre-recorded the story and they hear the story and then they retell it to you. And another version is where you tell one story using one set of pictures and then you give them a different set of pictures for them to tell the story. And the way it works is that stories have kind of, there's a thing called story grammar or these kind of large components of stories. So like something that initiates the story, maybe the setting where it happened, um, the actors have a goal they want to accomplish um, and that's called the macro structure. And macro structure is considered kind of universal. So um, the idea is that you can look at the macro structure of the story to work out is there a problem or is there not. Now, micro structure then looks in much more granular kind of detail at like grammatical components, the number of words, number of different words that is affected by exposure to language. So it wouldn't be as meaningful a measure of language in multilingual children as we say the macro structure component. And what's interesting about our version of it in Irish is that because um, there were very few, if any, monolingual speakers of Irish uh, in existence anymore. Um, we have allowed for what's called like code mixing or code switching in the responses. So if let's say the child is English and German speaking, you're, they're only, you want them to be using only English in the English version and only German in the German version and they get penalised if they mix. Right. But we've made the case that in Ireland that wouldn't work because it wouldn't be fair. It would actually penalise them unnecessarily and unfairly given the language context in Ireland. And um, the fact that Irish people often use English words um, as, as part of their um, normal Irish speaking mode. Absolutely. So that we are trying to match the assessment to the linguistic context that the children are operating in. So at the moment, we're collecting data in um, in Gael Scullina and um, Irish medium schools, uh, children aged four to seven. So that's one of the projects that we're working on. Um, you're also working in representat representations of people with dementia in, in newspapers. Can you tell me about that project? Oh, certainly. I wasn't expecting that question, <laughs> but that's OK. I'm delighted to talk about that. Um, so for my PhD, I looked at representations of cosmetic surgery in Irish media. Wow. So looking at television and magazines and how stories are told and the language that's used. 
So then I was thinking about, oh yeah, what about like people with communication impairments, for example, or different, you know, conditions. Um, so that was one of the ones that I have a paper just published on that, where we looked at stories in Irish newspapers that included the actual voice of the person themselves talking about their own experience. Because generally what's out there in the newspapers is about kind of dementia is like health promotion. So kind of putting the emphasis on what you can do to prevent it happening. Um, the carer's perspective about the person with dementia, but there's very little about using the voice of the person themselves or including the voice of the person themselves. So we did a, um, a search of um, new Irish newspapers, broadsheets over a certain period of time. And one of our main findings was actually, we found nothing <laughs> because there were so few stories of the person with dementia speaking themselves that we had to kind of extend our time frame until we found enough. Wow. And then what we found was that there was a tendency to have the same representatives from, let's say, the dementia organizations telling their stories. So you weren't getting great variety, a very small pool, very little variety. But what was really interesting was that you had a range, as you'd expect, I suppose, really of experiences. So you had some people saying, look, it's not the end of my life. I am living my life anyway. And then you had people recounting more negative kind of experiences. So I suppose the drive really to go down that route of research was to promote the importance of including the voice of the person with dementia in actual publicly, because if you can't see your story out there, um, you know, it, that leads to kind of maybe potential isolation or feeling like you're the only person experiencing it. And there are ways to incorporate the voice of the person with dementia um, into, let's say, media narratives. Yeah, and I suppose you know that's really um, it's a really important um, observation that that the, the voice of the individual um, is is really important. You, you lose that that person's voice, you sort of lose that identity. And I guess with language that 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 can happen again, right, Stash? I mean, in terms of someone moving from another country and 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 sort of immersing themselves in the culture of for Ireland, for example, for immigrants coming over to Ireland, um, the uh, not not speaking in your own authentic voice is that, does that have an effect on? Um, that person's sense of identity, do you think? I mean, you know, we have Ukrainian refugees coming over um, who are all going to Irish schools and learning through our, our Irish system. It, it, how important is it to speak through um, your own voice uh, and, and, and does that have an effect on your sense of, of identity? It is, yeah, definitely. I mean, it, when you hear my accent, for example, that's my identity. You immediately know about me from hearing the way I speak. And so that that's kind of like how other people perceive you, or they may always perceive you as someone who is from outside. And then the other thing is how you perceive yourself and how capable you are to express yourself in that new language. And for example, in Europe, we are more direct and we would speak in more direct way. And I know that sometimes when I speak to people, that is too direct uh, for for people who come from Ireland and for this culture, and mm -hmm. you can have really well. I mean that 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 is the case. Yeah. And so so you, I mean you're talking about your your Germanic influence here or your Serbian influence. Well, both. That that's very similar right. similar culture in They're that Frank. in in yeah, and it, it's it's kind of like uh, but also the the grammatically it's kind of more more direct. You don't use that many kind of uh, woulds and coulds and so on. Qualifiers and, yeah. and, and so, so on. Yeah. Yeah. So so actually if I if I don't think about that, I could come across as rude and I don't see myself as a rude person. Hmm. So it is a, a kind of really interesting dynamic between how you see yourself and how you're capable of using language. And you know also what comes uh, with, with in particular with immigrants, uh, there is this aspect that my language, my English, if you want, is never good enough. And uh, our colleague John Walsh said to me uh, recently, you know, kind of like as you become more proficient, that that's sort of getting better. But you have that feeling I'm never going to be perfect in this language. And uh, when we were doing some work together, I said to to our colleague John Walsh, I said something. Oh, you're you're a native speaker. Can you, maybe it's better that you do the title or something like that. And he replied to me and said, well, look, I don't want to take this position of native language supremacy. 
Your English <laughs> is good. So go ahead. You can do it yourself. Yeah. And you know, from that point, I see my my uh, capability, if you want, in English completely different. And I thought, okay, if that's what he thinks, then that's the case. And I should just go ahead, drop that idea of my English is never going to be perfect and just go ahead and use it. There is a real danger um, when, when, when we look at immigrant pop populations that um, the judgments are made based on the level of proficiency in the newly acquired language. And, and, and there, I, I, I've seen, um, you know, sort of comments and statements of someone where they assume a less intelligence, poor, poor education based on someone who is now um, moving from a, their own native language to another country and speaking excellently well in English, but not perfectly. And I find it so, it's so worrying to me that th that this happens. That you might have a doctor who's now, you know, um, and there are, there are cases like you, very very highly educated immigrants ending up doing jobs that are are perhaps not um, as prestigious in commas, here in Ireland. And people make assumptions in about that person based on the fact that their English is not perfect. And I'm wondering how is there is there a correlation? Has there been studies based on people's a, a gauging of, of a foreigner's intelligence based on their proficiency in the language. How, how do we counteract that? You know, it's not only foreigners. It's kind of like when people have a stroke and lose their language ability, they're immediately kind of treated as they're not as intelligent or they might be drunk. Right. You know, there, there were interesting studies, for example, how are people who had stroke treated in restaurants? And they were, they were sometimes not served because the, the staff thought that they were drunk and things like that. So uh, our language ability is something that kind of represents us, if you want, and mm. represents our intelligence and our, you know, that, that, that's another thing. Like when you hear me or anybody else speaking, you immediately kind of understand their level of education, possibly their profession even, um, you know, their intelligence, all sorts of things, their, their culture, their manners, all of that comes through your language. And that comes, uh, you know, whether you, you have language disability or disorder, or whether you are not proficient in that language, uh, that comes about. How mm. do we counteract it? Uh, well, awareness. Awareness is raising awareness, and that's what we are really doing today, raising awareness of multilingualism as a norm, raising awareness of people speaking multiple languages and kind of appreciating that they speak our language. Uh, let's say I don't speak any Arabic, for example. Yeah. You know, Syrian or people who came from Syria here, they do learn English and they're starting to speak English. The first time I had interactions with someone regularly who had um, a motor related condition that meant he, he couldn't speak words um, uh, he could vocalize, but not not words. I, I had to sort of retrain myself in my mind very quickly to because I saw how other people spoke to uh, to this person. And I and I thought what the, the natural instinct was for me to speak more slowly was for me to to break things down and it was only being around others and seeing of course that's not the way uh, but it was a natural instinct for me that i was almost ashamed of later on when i thought about how i was how i was planning on interacting with this person and i think maybe it's not necessarily a an intentional thing, but it, it, it comes from awareness. Um, I, I don't know what you think about that, but I, I, I th that day I felt extremely ashamed that I hadn't fully understood the condition and, and how had had to interact with someone who didn't have the fluency that I had. Yeah, the thing is, we, we do need to raise awareness of communication and communication disorders and language disorders and multilingualism kind of all together. And that's what we are doing lots of work um on mm. um the thing is sometimes you do need to change the way you communicate you need to kind of be aware of what is actually going on with that person because some people will have problems understand some people will have perfect understanding and problem to produce 
and then you have combined uh, uh, issues. Yeah. And let's say now I teach to uh, international students, so students who come to do our master's uh, program, and uh, actually both me and Mary Pat. And the thing is, how do you adjust your language? If you, if you keep your local language, uh, your colloquialisms and your jargon, people who come from, let's say, Indonesia are not going to understand you. Mm -hmm. So you do need to adjust your language uh, yeah. when you talk to, to, let's say, multilinguals. And you need to think about how you work that communication in the class where I have people from different continents and from different languages. How, how do you work that so that everybody understands everybody? Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, this is a skill. And this touches, again, on, on international English, if you want, which is different than than our local yeah it, there's a sort of a venn diagram of commonly used words in a way mary pat to finish off um how do you think we should foster a more openness to multilingualism in ireland and a, a more welcoming attitude to those who don't necessarily have the proficiency that we might have in the language um, well, if I think of like context, if I think of, let's say, speech and language therapy clinics, like creating a language friendly environment where, for example, you have, let's say, you know, words in different languages visible and you actually make the effort to learn some of even just if it's greeting and please and thank you and goodbye in the languages of the people you are working with. Um, so, for example, I read recently of an Australian uh, speech and language therapist who was able to do speech and language therapy reasonably well in 10 languages because she lived in a place where it was really diverse. And like some of the literature would say that if you accept a job in a location where your clientele are diverse, you have an ethical obligation to actually learn some of the languages. Mm. Um, another researcher from the States, Catherine Conard, would say that for, let's say, monolingual English speaking children who have uh, what's called a developmental language disorder, an intervention could be for them to learn another language because and also to kind of talk about how the languages are similar and different. So in speech and language therapy, we could also like really support the parents to keep up the home language because English is the community language. It's not really in danger, you know, it's going to kind of look after itself um, and give them ways to do that. Um, then if you think of schools, similarly having like, you know, a language friendly classroom and auditing your classroom to see like, does it look like, where is the visibility of all the different languages and cultures rather than just having, let's say, a token day where we, you know, acknowledge different cultures or whatever. Um, so I think that's really, those would be the ways I would suggest. Can I just go back to the paper about dementia? Because what I want to clarify about there is that actually that work arose from the work of a student here, um, Orla Short, who did it for her final year project. And the project was so good, then we decided we would aim to get it published. And my colleague, Claire Carroll, worked with us. So it was kind of the three of us were working on the paper together. Right. Uh, research is always good to, to, to uh, give credit where credit is due, I find. Um, it's been fantastic speaking with you, uh, Sasha and Mary Pat. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, so that's it for this episode of uh, Leading Minds. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. There's plenty more of these where you find this one. I'll see you next time.